Ronald Reagan, an unlikely person to uh, think about on this afternoon, but Ronald Reagan once said, nine words that should terrify anybody. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Um, well, I used to be from the government and I hope I did help. Um, but in 2005, I um, tried to change that from I'm from the government and I'm here to learn. <clears throat> I decided to make the journey across that metaphorical bridge from treatment service land to community recovery land because we were talking back then about this thing called recovery, but people in recovery were a bit like unicorns. You know, you'd hear a tell of them, see, but you never met them. You know, um, but I was, I was, I was informed that they did exist. In fact, uh, one guy from Manchester, there was, um, God rest him, he's dead now. But somebody said, "Didn't Derek find that recovery thing?" And then somebody said, "No, he died on his way to Jersey in the toilets at Weymouth, unfortunately, <laughs> tragically." Um, Absolutely true. So, but we decided, I decided, they do exist, um, but they're not going to come back across that bridge to tell us uh, in treatment. They've left. They've gone to a different place. They've emigrated. Yeah? Uh, they're very grateful for what we did to keep them alive, to keep them out of prison, and to keep them HIV free in the case of, in the case of injection drug use. But they didn't often come back, so I went in search of them some 10 years ago now. Uh, and what I want to talk about for the next 18 minutes or so is the things and people that we found on that side of the bridge. But before I do that, I just want to talk a little bit about this thing called asset-based community development. Because, Marx, and your aspiration to be the best place to live by 2020... If there are any public health colleagues present, then I would strongly encourage you to adopt the methodology of asset-based community development to inform your efforts over the, the quest to be the best place in, uh, to live by 2020, because asset-based community development frees you from, frees us from, the deficit thinking that we've been employing recently, well, as long as I can remember, until very recently. So basically, asset-based community development is really, really straightforward. Its critique of the orthodoxy is that in the past, what we've done is things called needs assessments. So as a public health professional, I would go into a community where people speak with an accent like mine. Of course, I've moved five, four miles now to the posh part of Manchester, um, although I, I still feel a bit like an intruder. Um, but we would go to those communities and we would get a list of deficits and we would remind people who live in that community that you live in, a, you live in an area with high crime, high pregnancy, poor literacy, poor numeracy, blah, blah, blah. And they'd say, give over, do it. Well, we knew that. Yeah. Uh, and how much did it cost us to find that out then? About £100,000, thank you very much. That'll do nicely. Yeah. <laughs> So, rather than do that, although if you're wedded to it, then please, if you need to confirm where the worst part of Guernsey is, or the worst part of Manchester, or Liverpool, or Glasgow, then feel free to spend £100,000 to have it confirmed in the name of a needs assessment. Or, you could take that as red, yeah, and you could actually go into those communities with your asset-based community development view, which would be that the glass is not half empty, the deficit view, and that these people are clients who have deficiencies that will only be met by us professionals, Monday to Friday, nine to five, yeah? Or we could actually go in and say, you've got the answers. You have got the answers. And the job of us, our job as professionals is to lift the veil, maybe, to actually introduce you to the solution, which is right under your nose. There are people in these communities who have recovered, who are recovering, uh, and our job is to introduce the people who are still suffering to those people who are recovering, and then get out of the way, quite frankly. Introduce them to the answer, and then get out of the way. So asset-based recovery differs fundamentally from treatment. Now, this is not an attack on treatment. It's a critique of orthodox deficit-based treatment. So in the land of treatment, people are patients, clients, and service users. In recovery, those same people become People, just people. People, <coughs> colleagues and friends. In treatment services, you have a form to fill in. In the land of recovery, you get a cup of tea and a hug. Yeah? Uh, evidence in the land of treatment is only numbers. Only numbers count. Everything's got to be turned into a number. 
Whereas in the land of recovery, stories are what counts. How did your kid do this thing? How did you, how did you do this, man? How did you make it here? Well, let me tell you. Good, I'll listen, yeah? In, in England now, we have this uh, idea of drug treatment, treatment for drug addiction, which is access to treatment, retention in treatment, and completion of treatment, yeah? In the land of recovery, that tra translates as jobs, homes, and friends. Somewhere to live and somebody to love, yeah? So you can see by looking at the slides, the deficit-based approach. So in the, in the world of asset-based recovery, the role of us professionals is to be on tap, but never, ever on top. Because we don't live, you know, so basically profession. So what we are looking for uh, is not what's wrong, but what's strong. Yeah, not what's wrong, what's strong. And then people become partners and co-producers of their own solutions, which often they know anyway. They just need to be encouraged to recognise that. The other difference of, in terms of asset-based community recovery is that the individual, not the individual is not important, but the individual is much less important than the community. It's a community thing. There is no I in recovery. Uh, clients, who were, people who were once clients in, tr in the world of treatment become citizens in the world of recovery. They become, they move, and interesting, we've already, this is a theme that's emerging at this conference, uh, people move from being passive victims with problems to being active participants in the solution. When I le I've left now, as I say, I left in this summer, and uh, that's me from a Guardian article in um, Skipton House, Department of Health, when I was a civil servant, glancing over at the Elephant and Castle, in those of you who know the South London, uh, that's one of the blocks of flats in the Elephant and Castle, and it just, it almost in a moment of epiphany, uh, the Guardian, it was for the Guardian article, but realising there we are, the, the symbolism and the poetry of it just, just hit me full square on. Here we are, suited and booted, uh, addressing the world through a spreadsheet, yeah? uh, access, retention and completion, and doing traffic light performance management systems from our very high tower block, whilst people down there are actually living their lives. Yeah? Um, so this notion of us and them. Uh, and we, we went from, when I first came into this business back in 1976, can you believe it? That, uh, that's, that's the, at the free, at the, uh, in the bad trip tent of the free festivals. I'll finish, we start, I'll finish on the psychedelic thing. Um, and it suddenly dawned on me that actually, what's happened to me? <laughs> you know, how, how have I gone up onto the 18th, whatever the floor is, of the, of the uh, government bureaucracy and lost my sense of self and, even with this accent, forgot who I am, basically? So, for the last 10 years, uh, I've basically tried to get rid of the suit, although it's a detox process, getting rid of the suit. I mean, not having a tie on now, I feel existentially challenged, you know. Uh, <laughs> but I'm getting there, I'm getting there. It's, liberation is at hand, you know. Um, but basically going to, to this notion of we, we're in this thing, genuinely, we're in this thing together. That, that, that in recovery, you alone can do it, but you cannot do it alone. That I can't, but we can. And they are two guys, uh, they're, 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 there's obviously myself, the guy uh, who I've got my arm around is a guy called Dominic, uh, the guy at the far side is his twin brother, David, and the guy in between who's got the T-shirt on saying, this is what clean looks like, it will be 20, he's 29 years clean and sober from a very serious heroin addiction. Uh, he's, this will be, God willing, this will be his 30th year coming up. Uh, one of the oldest members of Narcotics Anonymous, he wouldn't mind me saying, uh, in England. And he's now mentoring these two twins. Now, these two twins, my background's criminology uh, in another guy's, and when these two, uh, David's coming up for seven years now, clean and sober, and his twin brother Dominic is about a year behind him. And they were what are regarded in England as PPOs, prolific and priority offenders. Yeah? They are the 20% who commit 80% of the crime. But they're not just committing less crime. They haven't just moved from domestic burglary to uh, becoming the great cheese thieves, uh, you know, liberating Tesco's and uh, any other supermarket of cheese, batteries, Mac 3 razors and meat. Uh, they've stopped committing crime. What on earth have they done? 
And I said, they've found a brand new way of living. They have found a spiritual existence, a spiritual problem, spiritual solution to a spiritual malaise. You know, give over. <laughs> you know, that, that sounds a bit flowery for Manchester, doesn't it? You know, bear with me. Look at the evidence. Look at the evidence. You watch the, you will see. And more importantly, I have to say that the, the thing that's most heartwarming about the twins' recovery is their mother. Their mother was a, was a, not a, I wouldn't say a beaten woman, but she, you know, the shame and stigma of addiction, etc. Uh, and now their mother is like a different woman. She's like 20 years younger. She's full of pride that her sons, you know, did cause certain issues in that community, are now the solution in that community. But uh, being on the island, I, I went back and with, it, with a psychedelic theme, the prisoner. Do you remember the prisoner? Patrick McGill. I'm not a number. I'm a free man. What do you want? Information. You won't get it. You know, <laughs> Google it. And probably, yeah. <clears throat> but the, another difference, an observation on the difference between treatment and recovery. In the world of treatment, this is a bit cathartic for me, so uh, thank, you for, thank you for being here. Um, the objectification of people. You know, people become numbers. There's a guy... Used to be a guy on the harm reduction circuit called Ernie Drucker, and he used to have this great saying: "We need to get behind the bald statistics of epidemiology to taste the salty tears of the human beings who, who live there." Yeah, yeah. What does he mean? There are people behind those numbers. Yeah, there are people. Those spreadsheets are people's lives. Yeah, and behind those artificial targets and those massage figures, and the management speak, which masquerades as truth. On the recovery side of the bridge is love. <laughs> now, when do you ever hear that in the world, in the world of treatment? We, we're here because you hear it all the time in, uh, in the world of recovery. At the end of any narco Alcoholics Anonymous meeting or Narcotics Anonymous meeting or Cocaine Anonymous meeting or Drug Addicts Anonymous meeting, people will give you their phone number. Yeah? In a suspicious, paranoid world like ours is, why is he giving me his number? What's he after? What does he want? He wants nothing. In fact, he, all he wants is that he, it, for you to receive his gift because he, will, he, will, he who gives shall receive most. Yeah? They're giving, they want to help you because they love you. And when they say things to you, which are quite challenging, like take the cotton wool out of your ears and shove it in your mouth, you might hear something that's just going to save your life. That's rather rude and challenging. Yes, it is. Do you know why? Because I want to save your life. <laughs> because that's what the twins do. So I'm going to, do, I'm going to say that to you because I love you. And because somebody did it for me. So artificial targets, massage figures and management speak in the land of recovery are replaced by experience, strength and hope. And again, we've heard at this conference how important it is to offer people hope. There is a way out of this. Not, a, not an abstract theoretical way out of it. Not a, a, a way out just for people who can afford to go to for private treatment, etc., etc., like doctors, dentists, lawyers, and pilots, but for people like the twins, yeah? There is a way out. We can show you the way out of here. There are three postcodes, tragically now, in Glasgow, where the average age of male mortality is around 54. In the Calton area, Google it, the Calton area of Glasgow, men would have a better life chance on the Gaza Strip in Basra or in North Korea. And it's not just fried Mars bars and vitamin D deficiency. I'm sure they don't help. Yeah? Frying pizzas is an odd thing to do. Yeah? Uh, or a book fast tonic wine. What appears to be the thing that differentiates the experience of those men who die prematurely, and they die prematurely in Manchester and Liverpool as well, albeit they live 10 years longer than the demographic mirror images in Glasgow, is being alone. Social isolation is a death sentence, particularly for men. We aren't good on our own, yeah? We're like elephants. Leave us on our own with a bottle of white cider or an aqualung of white cider. No, sat, no apples were harmed in the production thereof, yeah? And we will die, yeah? We will die without any purpose and meaning. The thing about recovery and making the journey across that bridge from treatment to the land of recovery is where you find purpose and meaning, yeah? And I would like to give a recognition here to Johan Harry and his Brooke chasing the scream, or indeed his TED Talk. We've had a few TED Talks. You might want to look at it. It's a, it's a fantastic TED Talk. And he makes the point that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's human connection. Yeah? Bruce Alexander, the Globalization of Addiction, talks about poverty of the spirit. The book's subtitle, The Study in Poverty of the Spirit. Um, <laughs> 
we talk about the biopsychosocial. So I mentioned the social. I think Bruce Alexander's work, and indeed the work of Gabor Mate and others, bring us into a contemporary uh, appreciation of the, of the importance of spirituality with a small s, yeah? Not religiosity. Stress, not religiosity. Religion is for people who don't want to go to hell. Spirituality is for people who have already been, yeah? <laughs> It's not new in the, in, in the land of recovery, this stuff. It isn't new. In 1929, Carl Jung, the Carl Jung, treated a guy called Roland Hazard. This is the birth of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he pointed out, you can Google all this stuff, and he pointed out to Roland, Roland, in a Zurich accent as opposed to a Bury accent, your, your desire for intoxication is not a passing fancy. You're not a greedy drinker. The way you drink, pal, <laughs> the way you drink... I think you're looking for God. Your desire for intoxication is of a fundamental nature. It's not just about how much you drank. You drank too much. You're looking for God. You're looking for the spirit. Unfortunately, you're looking for it in the spirit. And you won't find God at the bottom of a bottle of vodka, although you'll think you will. Yeah, yeah. But unfortunately, when that bottle's gone up and you've woken up in four hours' time, God, God gone with it. <laughs> yeah. So, so... so Spiritus contra spiritum. You need a spiritual solution for the spiritual malady. So the link to psychedelics, I'm really excited about the link to psychedelics and the, and the talk that we got from Professor Norton from Ben. Uh, because again, it's not new. Bill Wilson, in, when he was in the town's hospital, Bill Wilson is one of the architects of Alcoholics Anonymous, along with a guy called Dr. Bob. And Bill Wilson, in 1934, in the town's hospital in New York, undergoing his fourth detoxification for alcohol, had what he regarded as a spiritual awakening. He went to the Dr. Siltworth and said, Dr. Siltworth, I've been stood on a mountain pass, the whole thing has lit up, and it's the, the, the breath of God has blown through me. Now, 99 times out of 100, that would have been... Uh, medicate that man... <laughs> Medicate him right now. What on earth is he talking about? He didn't. Just like Carl Jung had the humility and the wisdom to accept the spiritual side of recovery, so Dr. Siltworth, treating Bill Wilson, said, well, Bill, you know, whatever it is you're doing, pal, get on with it. <laughs> you're in a better place than you've been before. And if you, look, if you read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in Bill's story, he, this is, when I started studying this stuff, uh, it really jumped out at me. Because people get confused about this. Choose your own conception of God. Yeah? So when it says God in the 12 steps, choose your own conception of God. And Bill says, that statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain in whose shadow I had lived and shivered many years. I stood in the sunlight at last. And to me, what that means is we've now got a situation of bio, psycho, social, and spiritual. And in that spiritual place, I would put... Uh, the, 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 the possibility of psychedelics. It's not about how much you drink, yeah? Or what you drink, really. Um, it's more about, and as Ben has said, it's more about trauma. Pretty much every single addict and alcoholic I've met, and I've met hundreds, probably thousands, actually, over the years, nearly every single one of them, their addiction grew out of trauma. I can't think of an exception. Uh, and, of course, it's a, the spectrum trauma is a broad trauma, but nevertheless, it grew out of trauma. Now, here's the thing about the difference between, I like a drink, yeah? I'm not in recovery, I'm a friend of recovery and a student of recovery. <clears throat> but the difference between me and, and alcoholics is, for them, drink and drugs are not the problem, they are the solution, yeah? Fundamental difference. The problem was the trauma, the problem is living. And for them, drink and drugs are not the problem, they are the solution. And recovery is about finding a different solution. So what we're doing now, uh, and I'm, been doing for 10 years now and I intend to carry on doing it, albeit with a, with a new interest, renewed interest in psychedelics, is rediscovering the wisdom that is in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I know Narcotics Anonymous aren't, I don't think they're yet in Guernsey, but Alcoholics Anonymous are, and they're a real asset, and they know how this thing works. That's how it works. Recovery works by contributing, belonging, and learning. The five ways to well-being are the perfect way to get Guernsey the best place to live by 2020. And what does recovery say? Basically, the power of now. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That's why it's called the present. <laughs> and finally, that's where it began for me in the bad trip tent of the Deep Lavelle Free Festival in 1976. <laughs> you will note 
the reference to psilocybin mushrooms and Amanita muscaria. And, and it's not where it's going to end, it's where it's going to begin. Thank you very much.